Welcome back. I'm the Intense MD, a double board certified intensivist, here to give you an inside look into the intensive care unit. The topic of today's discussion is ARDS, or Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. This is a very common diagnosis in the ICU. I'm actually surprised I haven't made a dedicated video about this diagnosis, although I have mentioned it in prior videos. This is a serious medical condition that involves the lungs, and it can turn into severe respiratory failure, and many people die from it. Many times, ARDS or ARDS is caused by an underlying medical condition, such as pneumonia or trauma, and it is a very rapidly progressing medical condition that can lead to low blood oxygen levels and difficulty breathing. So as I said, many people die from this condition. It, there are studies that report a range between 27 and 45 percent of people in the United States who have ARDS have died from it. There are also some reports that up to 60 percent of people who have been critically ill from ARDS have died from it. Personally, I have seen many people die from this condition, particularly during the pandemic, but we'll get into that later. A study published in early 2020, of course, before the data from the pandemic, reported an incidence, that means how many occurrences of ARDS, was approximately 79 in 100,000 people. In medical record data collected between 2015 and 2018, it re reported that 46 million Americans were affected by this diagnosis. So like I said, this is a life-threatening diagnosis involving the lungs. Many times the patients have a rapid onset of feeling short of breath, they have hypoxia or low oxygen levels, they might have chest pain, feel like their heart is racing, feel like they're breathing very quickly, and their what we call work of breathing is very difficult. And sometimes they can have production of sputum that looks very frothy or bloody. As this disease progresses, the patient can become tired from using so much energy to breathe, and they can have an altered level of consciousness. They be can become more confused, typically due to having low oxygen levels in their blood. All these symptoms are triggered by a high level of inflammation in the lungs. The lungs become very inflamed, and there are different phases of ARDS. There are three phases of ARDS. The first is called the exudative phase. This is the first phase of the disease process. This is when patients begin having symptoms. This is usually the first seven to 10 days of the acute respiratory distress syndrome. And I just wanna mention that these phases are named for what is happening on the cellular level within the lungs. The second phase is called the proliferative phase, and this can go on for two to three weeks post-diagnosis. The final phase is the fibrotic stage. This is the scariest stage because this is when we see what damage has been done by ARDS. Fibrosis is scarring. So somebody's lungs can have severe scarring from all of the inflammation that happened in the first phase of ARDS. And when I go on and talk about the treatment strategies for ARDS, you'll see that early diagnosis and early intervention is very important because our goal is to minimize the amount of inflammation in the lungs, to minimize the damage and that is long-term because our goal is to minimize permanent damage to the lungs, scarring to the lungs. There are a couple different disease processes that cause ARDS. The first is sepsis, and I've talked about sepsis in prior videos, but this is an inflammatory reaction caused by an infection. So the infection doesn't necessarily need to be in the lungs. It can be in a different part of the body, but the inflammation caused by that infection can affect the lungs and lead to ARDS. The next might be more apparent, and that is pneumonia. This can be a bacterial pneumonia or a viral pneumonia. I commonly see ARDS with viral pneumonia, such as influenza and COVID-19. Many people who died from COVID-19 died because they had ARDS, and they had progressed 
to the fibrotic phase where there was so much scarring in their lungs, nothing else could be done. Aspiration is another cause, and this is when somebody gets food, saliva, liquid into their lungs because instead of swallowing it down through their esophagus, there's, there's something wrong with their swallowing mechanism or something happened at the time they attempted to swallow and some of the debris went into their lungs and this can cause inflammation. It can cause what's called aspiration pneumonitis or go on to an infection called aspiration pneumonia. Severe traumatic injuries such as a car accident or a fall, anything that causes blunt force trauma to the thorax can lead to further inflammation. Inhalation injuries such as smoke or other chemicals. Pancreatitis, which is a condition where the pancreas is inflamed. And there are several causes of pancreatitis, but some of the most common are alcohol, a gallstone blocking the duct into the pancreas, or high, super high cholesterol levels, hypertriglyceridemia, which is a specific type of cholesterol. And it is rare, but blood transfusions. If somebody gets a massive amount of blood products in a short period of time, this can cause inflammation in the lungs. It is a separate condition called trolley or transfusion related acute lung injury, and that can also progress. So obviously there are multiple different things that can cause this disease process, which means multiple different types of people can be at risk. There are multiple different risk factors depending on the scenario and the patient. It's something that I hope that I have made apparent is this is a medical emergency and early diagnosis and treatment is very important in terms of increasing the likelihood of the patient's survival. Again, it does not guarantee survival but it does increase the likelihood of survival and minimizes the amount of further injury done to the lungs. So that being said, the, the cornerstone of treating ARDS is protecting the lungs from further damage. So there are multiple ways we do that. One is to decrease the inflammation in general. Sometimes, and this can be done by giving a steroid, which decreases the amount of inflammation in the body. There was a lot of debate over the steroid dosing during the COVID pandemic, but experts agreed that giving a course of steroids early in the diagnosis was shown to be beneficial. It is a little bit of a debate in the critical care community, but many of us advocate for early ventilation, early intubation. This means putting the patient on the ventilator as they're starting to show signs of progression before it becomes an emergency, before they're in florid respiratory failure. The reason for this is to let the lungs rest. By putting a patient on the ventilator and taking over the breathing for them, then their lungs only have to focus on healing rather than keeping the person alive and breathing for them in addition to trying to repair themselves. Another treatment strategy that's been shown to improve mortality, the number of people who die from this disease, is deeply sedating the patient on the ventilator and giving them a neuromuscular blockade which paralyzes the breathing muscles so 100% of the breathing is taken over by the vent and the patient's lungs are breathing in sync with the vent because many times diseased lungs try to fight the ventilator. They try to do their own thing and breathe against the ventilator, but when you deeply sedate someone and paralyze their breathing muscles, then they're able to breathe in sync with the ventilator while they're getting lung rest. The second piece of this is doing lung protective ventilator strategies. There is an ARSNET protocol where it recommends the appropriate ventilator settings for a particular person with ARDS. So the amount of volume they are getting from the vent is dependent on their ideal body weight, not their current weight, 
their ideal body weight, which is based on their height, because people of different heights have different lung volumes. I'm taller, so my lung volume would be much higher than somebody who is a foot shorter than me. We do not want to give somebody's lungs too much volume because this can cause further damage and injury with something called volume trauma. Another aspect of the ventilator is giving oxygen through positive pressure and through a fraction of inspired oxygen or FiO2 percentage. The positive pressure is also known as PEEP. So we, don't, we want to give someone a high enough PEEP to keep their airways open, but we do not want to cause barotrauma. This is the injury in the lungs from too much pressure. So of course, sometimes people do need very high ventilator settings, a high PEEP, but this is when we look at risk versus benefit. The risk of not giving them the positive pressure they need can lead to death. The risk of having a high pressure can cause increased pressure in the thoracic cavity that can lead to a collapsed lung, which we then need to put a chest tube in to take away that air around the lung. And that's not air within the lung, that is air between the lung and the rib cage. Another treatment tactic is minimizing how much fluid we give the patient. Because if somebody has what we call fluid overload, that's a high body volume of fluid, then it can back up into the lungs and cause more lung injury and inflammation that way. So we are very cautious how much fluid we give someone, and sometimes we give them a diuretic to decrease the amount of volume that goes into their lungs causing pulmonary edema. Another strategy that benefits ARDS patients is putting them in a prone position. So that's taking them from their back onto their stomachs. And this is, it sounds like a very simple thing to do, but when somebody is on a ventilator, has multiple IV drips, different tubes, sometimes they'll have chest tubes in, flipping the patient over takes multiple staff members, such as the physician being at bedside if there is an emergency, the respiratory therapist, at least one, maybe two, helping with the airway and making sure the patient's tube does not become dislodged, and multiple nurses and CNAs who help flip the patient from their back to their stomach. But this has been shown to help open up the airways in the back of the lungs by flipping the patients over. And finally, of course, giving the patient appropriate nutritional support. So though many times this is done through tube feeds if a patient's on the ventilator. This is a very common ICU diagnosis and a lot of research has been done on this diagnosis over the years to figure out the best way to manage a patient with ARDS. There have been multiple landmark trials to find what the best way to care for these patients is. The first, of course, is the ARDSnet trial, and that has to do with the ventilator settings that I discussed earlier in this video. The next is the FAC trial, which has to do with the fluid management I discussed. And the PROCEVA trial is the trial that showed that 16 hours of prone positioning increased oxygenation and improved mortality in ARDS patients. Where do we go if patients are failing these treatments? We have them on the ventilator. We have their respiratory muscles paralyzed. We have them in prone position. And despite this, their lungs are still having difficulty with gas exchange and providing oxygenation. One thing we may consider is ECMO. This is extracorporeal membranous oxygenation. I did a video on this a long time ago, but it is a device where it takes the blood out of the body, runs it through a machine that oxygenates the blood and puts it back in the body. This is only done at specialized centers by physicians and staff who are certified to care for these patients. The selection criteria for ECMO is strict because we look at if the patient has a chance of recovering. So if somebody already has progressed to the stage of fibrosis, they are not an ECMO candidate unless they are a candidate for a lung transplant.
if somebody is very early in the phase of ARDS and it looks like they have a chance of recovering, then they will be placed on ECMO with the hope of recovery. So ECMO is a bridge. Again, it is a life support device. So either it is a bridge to the patient recovering or a bridge to lung transplantation. So of course, the second option, if somebody is failing to improve and recover from ARDS is a lung transplant. I'm going to make a organ transplant series in the near future, and I will go much more in depth about lung transplantation there. But I do want to say that the criteria for any organ transplant is very strict. Each center is slightly different, but there are multiple criteria a patient needs to meet for a lung transplant. Because if you think about it, it is a finite resource. You need to have a donor. You need to have a donor who matches the recipient. And particularly in lungs, the height needs to be similar because like I said earlier, somebody who is five foot could not get lungs from somebody who is 5'10 because the lungs will be too large for their thoracic cavity. So obviously fibrosis is a very feared complication of this disease process. Some other complications are the other organs going into failure. Somebody can get kidney failure, liver failure, because if your oxygen levels are dangerously low, all of your organs in your body are not getting the oxygen that they need to function. And this is not to say people don't survive from ARDS, but if you have severe ARDS, the road to recovery is very, very long. And I think this became apparent during the COVID-19 pandemic this past several years. Like I said, I will discuss organ failure and organ transplant in future videos. If you have any questions about ARDS, please leave them below. This is a very dense topic. There is a lot of research and information about it. And unfortunately, it does have a high mortality rate. Thank you for watching this video until the end. I'll be back next Tuesday and we are starting our organ failure series next week. So if you wanna hear more about organ failure, Next week will be the video to watch. I'll see you then.